Hello, and welcome to Webinar Wednesdays. My name is Darlene True Christ, and I work with the Deep Carbon Observatory's engagement team in Synthesis Group 2019. And today, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce Mark Parsons, who will share with us the ins and outs of how and why to use site data. Mark is a senior research scientist of the Tetherless World Constellation at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, commonly known as RPI. And there he researches mediation and how researchers actually share data and collaborate. And Mark brings vast knowledge to the topic today. He was the first secretary general of the Research Data Alliance where he served until July, 2017. He has led major data stewardship efforts for more than 20 years and received the award from the American Geophysical Union, the Charles S. Falkenberg Award, for his work as an advocate of robust data stewardship and having the um, having data stewardship as a vital component of earth science and a profession in its own right. And we're delighted to have Mark share his vast knowledge with us today. But before I turn it over, just a little housekeeping. If you have questions during the presentation, you'll see along the bottom of your screen, there's a chat room. Just please mark your question down and then Mark will do everything he can do at the end of the presentation to answer your questions fully and completely. And um, he should speak of roughly around 25 minutes so you can plan on joining him for roughly a half hour. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Thank you, Darlene. Um, so yeah, I am gonna talk to you about why and how to cite data. This is a little different from what was in my original abstract, which gets in more of the technical details. I think I, need, I felt I needed to really sort of take a step back and deal with some of the fundamentals. So the title in and of itself is the outline of the talk. So let's just start with why to cite data. And, um, ah, and it's because science requires you to show your evidence. It's a fundamental tenet. Um, and there's been recent, we perhaps have heard of the reproducibility crisis. There was a nature survey done fairly recently that found that more than 70% of researchers have tried and failed to reproduce other scientists' experiments. And more than half failed to reproduce their own experiments. And so it really highlights why it's necessary to have the data underlying your assertions. And to give you maybe just a, a illustration of that is here's a little story. Back in 2011, um, when I was working for the National Snow and Ice Data Center, the Times Atlas put out a news release saying that the Greenland ice, shank, ice sheet is shrink, shrunk by 15% since 1999. So in um, 12 years, the ice shrunk 15%. But then... Headlines a couple of days later, oh, no, outrage glaciologists say that mappers misrepresented the data. Map makers claim on the shape of Greenland suddenly melts away, etc. Well, so why was this? Was this the culprit? So this is a product that the National Snow and Ice Data Center puts out called the Atlas of the Cryosphere that provides um, visualizations and maps of a lot of data around snow and ice. And this is a digital elevation model of the Greenland ice sheet. It's not meant to show where the extent of the ice sheet, it's meant to show the thickness and the resolution of it is fairly coarse, so it doesn't get the ice around the edges, um, where it's also very difficult to do a DEM there. Um, so we suspect that this may have been the source of the erroneous map. And there were not perfect, but for perfectly functional um, citations for both the atlas and the underlying data and an associated paper that supports the underlying data. But we don't know what the Times did because they did not cite their source. And they continue to stand by the accuracy of their maps while they have said that the press release was indeed wrong, that there was not a 15% shrinkage in the ice sheet. How that works, I don't know. But the point is, without citation, you cannot verify assertions. And this is being strongly reinforced by a new project from the American Geophys led by the American Geophysical Union in collaboration with many others. And all the major publishers in Earth Sciences and beyond, I mean, this is very much focused on Earth and Space Sciences, this project, but all the major publishers, as you can see listed there, are going to have a common set of author guidelines. And one of the, I quote from those 
author guidelines, which will be released soon, is to they require authors to cite and link to the data in the article following these particular principles and using unique, resolvable, and persistent identifiers. So even if you're not concerned about the science, if you want to publish, you're going to need to start citing your data. And of course, you're concerned about the science. So, but there's broader purposes of data citation. The primary purpose, as I mentioned, is to aid scientific reproducibility through a direct, unambiguous connection to the precise data used, but is also a mechanism to give credit for data authors and data stewards. Um, the intellectual effort that goes into producing a data set should be, deserves the same recognition of the intellectual effort that goes into producing other research artifacts. It's similarly, there's accountability. You know, we, we have accountability for the data. And it also helps us track the impact of the data, helps identify how the data are used, helps data authors themselves, the producers of the data, can see how their data are being used, which is often of great interest. And users can also better understand how the, how, how the data have been used in the past when they're, when they're using the data. So there's a lot of reasons that we should be citing, citing data, uh, with the primary one being its science. So how is it currently done? So I actually produced this slide probably, oh, at least 10 years ago. And I keep thinking I should update it, but it doesn't seem to be the need. So sometimes people cite a traditional publication, a, a literature publication that actually contains the data, such as a parameterization value or something like that. Often it's not mentioned, it's just used in tables or whatever. Um, sometimes there's a vague reference in the text, you know, data from the Deep Carbon Observatory, something like that. Sometimes a URL, but with varying degrees of specificity, you know, if it just pointed to the DCO data portal, that doesn't tell you very much if you don't point to a specific data set. Sometimes there's a citation to a related paper, so not even the data itself, but a paper about the data, which is sometimes appropriate, but often becomes outdated. And I use the example of the um, classic temperature records um, that have been controversial on that indicate how um, the planet has been warming, and the recommended citation for those is actually a paper that's several years old while the um, temperature records are still ongoing. And then ideally, there is a citation of an actual data set with a specific recommendation given by a data center, and ideally using a persistent identifier. Unfortunately, it's not being done. Um, so this is a pretty dated figure, and I'm not able to reproduce it because it's done by the black box of Google Scholar. But you can see for this particular data set, which is a remote sensing data set of snow cover, um, that there's not even a trend there. It's, it, there. it's being heavily used, and there's a lot of times that it's being mentioned, but it's rarely formally cited. So there's actual formal guidance on how to do this. Um, there's actually a lot more than this out there, but I thought that these were sort of three highlight works that are worth um, noting. First is um, a CoData task group. CoData is a body of the International Council of Science, um, put together a pretty comprehensive review of the state of the art, at least as of 2013. It hasn't ch changed a whole lot since then. Um, so to really understand sort of the state of the art, I would recommend that. That led to a bunch of different organizations getting together, um, working um, within Force 11 to produce what is, now, is called the Joint Declaration of Data Citation Principles. And this has really gotten the community, at least the data community, rallied around how to do this. The publishers accept this, the librarians accept this, the data centers accept this. These, these, are, the, these are the principles that everybody's on board with. And then specifically for Earth Science, the Federation of Earth Science Information Partners has developed some more specific guidelines. And actually, they're meeting um, next month, and they will be working to revise those guidelines and update those guidelines. So what is it? Oh, back to the, um, I wanted to note the principles. So here are the, um, the, the noble eightfold path to citing data. So these are the eight joint de declared principles that everybody agrees with, that data, data citations should you know, reinforce the importance of data. They should facilitate credit and attribution. Their purpose is to provide evidence behind an argument. They need to have some, some sort of unique identification so you know exactly what's being cited. They need to provide some level of access. The data behind them need to be persistent if we were to verify the um, experiment you know, some many years later. And they need to be specific and verifiable and ideally interoperable and flexible so that they can work with um, multiple systems. 
And it's really not that hard. Here is an example of a data citation. And it looks very similar to a paper or book citation. And I won't go into all the, the, the bits because ideally the repository that you're getting the data from should provide you with a citation. Um, if you are the creator of the data, um, you might consider yourself the author and you could, and in, in this case, you would actually cite yourself. The, if, when submitting your data to a repository, they're going to work with you to determine who are the so-called authors or creators of the data set. And then the rest is fairly straightforward. You know, uh, release date, um, versions, titles. We have editors in this, and this is just to point, that, point out that that's you know, an option. Um, and then there's a publisher, um, in this case, the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And then this last bit, this, there's a URL there, but that's actually pointing to a digital object identifier or, or a persistent identifier. And that's really sort of the critical piece of the citation. And we, we use these commonly now for articles, um, but now we want to use them for data as well. And so when you, but where does that take you? You know, it's not, not, there's been a lot of debate in the community as to, does the URL point to the data set itself? Does it point to documentation? The uh, consensus is that it should point to a so-called landing page that provides access to the data and access to metadata. And so that, that citation actually points here. This is what you would get if you clicked on that link. And, but what's important to recognize is that it's for humans and machines. And I will, I will come back to that. So similarly, the Deep Carbon Observatory data portal has landing pages um, for its data. Um, and you'll notice this right here, this DCOID. Those, that, this is the persistent identifier that the Deep Carbon Observatory uses. It's very similar to a DOI. It uses the same underlying technology, but it just is um, managed through by the, the portal itself rather than by an external entity. As I mentioned, it's really important that these landing pages are accessible for both humans and machines. So this often means so in other words, the machine needs to understand what it can do when it gets to this landing page, because it's not obviously going to read it like a human. So there's this notion called content negotiation. And the idea is that with any particular identifier, you can get different languages, if you, if you will. You know, do you speak French, or do you speak HTML, or JSON, or RDF? So you can return that landing page page in different formats that need ways that can be embedded into other pages, plugged directly into applications, et cetera. So that, although it's not immediately visible from those landing page examples I gave you, that is something that's possible to do um, with access as then with a computer. So this is just sort of an example of how with this particular content negotiation system, you know, you can get you go to the publisher landing page, or you can go to a particular metadata service provided by Crossref. Yeah, and just and put the the uh, results back in RDF. And then what we're working with in within DCO, we're using identifiers. So identifiers, I should clarify, are registered numbers that are um, with that include a location for where you can access the digital object in a registry that is managed by a trusted service. And if ever you move the data or if the location changes or if we start using a different protocol or something like that, then you update the registry so that the identifier always resolves and that the service provides a res resolution service that always resolves to the landing page. But we're using identifiers for much more than data within BCO and we're trying to connect the pieces across projects, uh, excuse me, and, and, and even people. And so that's where, for example, we have the use of ORCIDs, a different type of identifier used for identifying researchers. So this connection with all sorts of different artifacts, so we want to see how a person relates to a data set, relates to a publisher, relates, I mean, to a publication, relates to maybe a grant. Um, this is something that we can do when we have identifiers on all these things and how they're all connected. But again, that still needs to be managed. So one of the things that we've been doing in DCO is working with a group in the Research Data Alliance, a global member organization that is working on mechanisms to improve data sharing, sort of infrastructure underlying data sharing. Um, and so there's this 
project called the Scholarly Link Exchange, which is bringing publishers and repositories and the major um, identifier providers, literature identifier providers and data identifier providers together into a common hub that provides links between the data and the article and the article and the data. So article cites data, but data may also reference article and being able to capture that all in a consistent way so we can um, better track how data are used over time. So we've just started to implement this and we're just beginning to explore what that means. Um, in essence, it's really, uh, like I say, it's a framework for standardizing the exchange of these scholarly links between the different infrastructure providers. And so what we need to do at one level is simply maybe modify the metadata with, behind our identifiers to accommodate that, but we're exploring um, how it might have broader uh, applications as well. Now, I want to go back to this notion of this basic data citation form and content. Like I said, it's very much the same as um, a literature citation. This, so this comes from the ESIP guidelines. But there's two things at the end that I'd like to highlight. The data, date and time it was accessed, which is often a common practice when citing a URL. Um, and we recommend that even when citing a digital object identifier or other persistent identifiers, because in some cases the data may have changed and in that versioning may not have been captured. We also recommend that you mention the subset of the data that you used. For example, if you extracted um, a geographic um, subset out of the data or a temporal subset. But the, frankly, those are imperfect hacks for how we would really like to do this. So there's another group within um, the Research Data Alliance that, uh, oh, I want to get there. So in essence, what we were talking about here is what we might call micro citation. And so it's, it's citing a, a particular verse in a book, you know, a particular quote where you would use page numbers in a, in a classic literature citation. Um, but as I like to hear, page numbers don't really work for digital objects. But we might think of how other texts have handled this, that with this notion of sort of a structural index where you have, and this has often been used by holy texts like the Bible, where you have chapter and verse. So you have different sections of the, uh, the document or the data in this case. So in the case of earth science data, your structural index might often be space and time. You can reference the particular data used by space and time. But as I've mentioned, there's this other RDA Research Data Alliance project that is trying to address this question of dynamic data citation. And it essentially takes that structural index um, concept to a new level. And the idea is that you cite the data as well as a particular query of the data. So recognizing that data is often constantly changing, it may be growing, it may be reversioned, it may be recalibrated, um, that you need to be able to cite specifically which data set you used and specifically what subset of that data you used. And so the idea is you have to have very careful versioning of the data with timestamps, and then you need to have a way to store and assign a persistent identifier to the query, which might be you know, a space and time query, and then put timestamps on that and be able to retrieve that again in the future. So this is the other project that we're working on to try and enable not just citation of whole data sets, but the very specific data that was used in a specific study. So this is sort of more of the cutting edge of citation, if you will, where the basic notion of citing whole data sets, I think, is very firmly established, even if it hasn't been broadly adopted. And then finally, I'd just like to give a little plug to this project, Making Data Count, because as I mentioned, although the primary purpose for data citation is um, how you're showing the evidence behind your assertions, it's also, we also want to make sure that people get credit and understand how data are being used over time. And so this project is also working to encourage data citation and trying to develop metrics for measuring, you know, we really probably don't want a data impact factor, but some sort of indication of how the data is being used over time. And so this should be, I think, welcomed by data producers in that they get a better understanding of how their data are being used and hopefully recognition for making that research artifact available. 
so that's sort of a whirlwind tour. Um, thank you all for attending. I'm happy to take any questions. And I, our last slide announces the, the next book. Thank you, Mark. That was great. Early on, um, you listed a slide with all of the publications that will require data access. Do you have any idea as to when that might happen? Is it current or what's the time frame? So the project is underway right now. Um, that uh, the document that I have there in that in that little um, URL um, is. 99% final. In fact, I think we're having a discussion about it with the steering committee for the project this afternoon. And Shelly Stahl is online. She could actually tell me precisely, but I believe the goal is to have a formal release in about a month. Wow. And then, and then how quickly each of the individual um, journals adopt that, I think that's maybe more of an open question. I see there is a, something in the chat that maybe is Shelley chiming in. Shelley says that I am correct. Great. Um, Shelley responds, um, we should see something mid-July. Thank you, Shelley. Shelley, if you have anything else to add, we're happy to unmute you and put you on camera as well. <laughs> We just unmuted. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I, Mark did a great job. I have nothing to add. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. Yes. The thing I had, if no one else has questions, is um, are there guidelines for metadata? Oh, the metadata that should be behind us, associated with the citation? Mm -hmm. um, yes, there are many guidelines. Um, there, the data site, which is probably the biggest holder of, of persistent identifiers for data, has a metadata schema for stuff that they want, you know, explicitly captured with the the DOI, and it's pretty much those citation elements, you know, author, um, distributor, things like that, and and but also things like type um, and other things. But in terms of the metadata necessary to use the data, which is really what's um, much more important, um, that is really dependent upon the specific context um, and the specific discipline. Mm -hmm. um, there is guidance out there by discipline. And this is something actually the AGU project is grappling with. We want to see if there's some sort of bare minimum that might work across many disciplines. Um, but the idea is that if the data are in a certified repository, this is a sort of a different topic, that part of that certification is that they're doing a good job of documenting and providing basic metadata for, that, uh, for their data. Great, thank you. Does anyone have further questions? There's a little button you can raise your hand and, um, or write them in the chat. We'll give you a moment. Looks like there are no more questions out there, but Mark, it was great. You really enlightened this part of the screen. Thank you very much. It, it seems to be a huge challenge to implement. Um, I don't think it's that hard. It's the big, the big thing is the, the culture shift. Um, mm -hmm. and if, and, but frankly, if the publishers start to enforce it, it, it will happen because if people want to publish, they will need to cite their data. Thank you. And I would like to add for everyone who hasn't read the chat, Shelley volunteers that Mark is fantastic with two exclamation points, and we agree. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Shelley is very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> but before we go, I wanted to, Mark had briefly the um, next webinar up on his screen. It's July 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And Fang Hong will discuss data science for geosciences data processing. And this is the third in our series of um, data science related webinars. And they've, they've been great, really informative. And they're all, once um, they're finished, they're posted on DCO's YouTube site. So please share them with your colleagues as well. With that, thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. Thanks, and thank you everyone for joining us as well. Okay, ciao. Take care.